Well, well, thank you, Dean. It's great to be here, David, with you thank to you. kick off the second, I guess it's the second annual book festival for, New Orleans, for Tulane in New Orleans. It's great to be here. Um, first, David, I want to say how much I loved How to Invest. Um, I've devoured your other three books, but this one in particular I found interesting because so much of your personality and your thinking came through in this book. And also because it's just so relevant, I think, for anyone who's an amateur investor or a professional investor to kind of think about how to invest more wise, more smartly, smart, more smartly wiser. Um, and I bet it was a really fun book for you to write. Um, but before I get into the book, I, 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 I have to ask you this, and this will serve as an introduction to the very few people here who don't know of the legendary David Rubenstein. You're the co-chair of the Carlisle Group, you're one, which is one of the world's largest and most successful private equity firms. You're chair of the National Gallery of Art, chair of the Council on Foreign Relations, chair of the Economic Club of Washington, D.C., chair of the University of Chicago, former chair of Duke, former chair of the Smithsonian, chair of the Harvard Advisory Council, chairman emeritus of Brookings, and I'm not even including about 10 other chairmanships that you have because there's just too many to mention. You host two interview shows on Bloomberg, one on PBS, you're a father, and I believe a grandfather, and one of the world's most generous philanthropists. So my first question is, how in the world do you have enough time to write books? Well, I don't play golf. Um, <laughs> that saves about 10 hours a day, I'd say. I don't play golf, but I, I am uh, tunnel vision on getting things done. I would say I'm, everything I'm doing, I enjoy doing. I'm not doing anything I don't enjoy doing. And uh, when you enjoy it, it's not work, it's, it's fun. Also, I'm now uh, an age I never thought I'd live to be, uh, 73 years old. When I, um, you, some of you may remember, John Kennedy was president of the United States. His father was the old man who was Joe Kennedy. I looked it up recently, and I saw these pictures of old Joe Kennedy, and he was 71. Uh, when I went to practice law in New York, the old man who started the firm, who was a famous judge, kind of came in to give us advice to the to, to people starting that day, and he was a famous judge named Judge Rifkin. And I looked it up. I thought he was a doddering old man. He was um, 71. And I remember telling President Carter, you don't have any trouble getting reelected because you're running against an old, old man who can't get out of bed in the morning. He's 69 years old, Ronald Reagan. How can he get out of bed at that age? Now I'm 73. So uh, making, at this age, I realized you've you, you got to get things done if you, if you waste time you know, you don't have an infinite amount of time to waste at this point. So, you know, given the laws of uh, physics and, and the laws of uh, nature, it's unlikely that I'll be doing this, you know, forever. So i trying to get as many things done as I can um, and just I enjoy every one of the things I've chosen to do. So it's not that difficult. Well, well you start a good number of your interviews and in how to invest with the same simple question. Did you grow up wanting to become a great investor? And interestingly, most said no. So let me, let me ask you, let me turn the tables and ask you that question. You grow up uh, in Baltimore, Maryland, the son of a postman. I can't imagine that in, that in the environment you grew up in, you were thinking as a kid, I'm going to be, become a great investor. So what did you think as a kid you were going to grow up to be? Well, when you grow up with modest means, uh, you know, you realize you're going to have to get somewhere uh, on your own. And so actually it's one of the great pleasures of my life was actually, in hindsight, growing up without having a lot of wealth and expectations. People didn't expect that much from me, and I didn't expect to be anything other than, uh, you know, Sandy Koufax or something. I thought I was in a Little League All-Star. I didn't realize, though, because it was, I was a Little League All-Star because it was an all-Jewish league, so it wasn't that difficult to be an All-Star. Uh, but I, when I realized I wasn't going to be Sandy Koufax, I decided to go into something else, and I went to law school thinking I would go into government and politics because I'd always admired President Kennedy. And I didn't think I was smart enough, handsome enough, charming enough, or rich enough to be a candidate. But I thought I could be an advisor. And I went to work for Ted Sorensen at, in New York, right. who was an advisor to President Kennedy. And I thought his pixie dots might rub off on me. But after a couple of years, he said, you know, maybe you shouldn't practice law either uh, because you're not that good at it. So I had to go down to politics and do other things. And I thought I would wind up in government politics my whole life. I had no interest in making money. I had grew up with no money. My parents made about $10,000 a year when I was growing up, and I, I just had no interest in it, and investing was not something I yeah. had any interest in. But I, I do tell people all the time, you should experiment with many different things in your career because it's very unlikely that you're going to find, like Bill Gates, what you wanted to do uh, when you're very young and you drop out of college to do it. More likely not, if you experiment, you'll find different things, and hopefully by the age of your mid-30s, you'll find the thing that you really want to do, and that will be your passion in life. And that's what you need to find your passion, because 
you know, if you want to win a Nobel Prize, you have to love what you're doing. Nobody won a Nobel Prize hating what they do. <laughs> and if you can't find something you're, you're, you really enjoy, that's a sad thing. I found something in the mid to late 30s that I really enjoyed, and, and I got lucky. Yeah, that, the smartest advice I ever got was from a book agent who said, first 35 years of your life, do as many interesting things as you can. From 35 to 55 or 60, do that thing that you are most passionate about and best at, make as much money as you can, and then from 60 till your death, do the things again you want to do. Uh, I, I, in my book on leadership, I said, look, you divide life into three parts. In the first third, you have people who are the Rhodes Scholars, uh, Heisman Trophy winners, student body presidents, first in their class, valedictorians. Um, very often, not in the case of Walter Isaacson, who was a Rhodes Scholar, but very often, um, <laughs> they just kind of coast in the second third, and they don't win the, the race in the third third. And so very often, people who turn out to be the leaders of our society tend to be people who didn't win the first third of life, but they, you know, like the tortoise and the hare, they caught up, and they basically passed the people who, um, who, who were the superstars early on. So I've gone back and said, when I was growing up, who were the superstars? Well, my high school class of 1,500 people, a big public high school, uh, the person, there was only one person who got into Harvard. President of the student body, all-American lacrosse player, first in the class. And I said, wow, I wonder what happened to this person. I looked it up recently, and he's teaching Tai Chi for $125 an hour in Westchester County. So he dropped out of Harvard, didn't actually mount anything. The person in my high school class who wasn't a superstar, me, wound up becoming more successful. So you just never know. And I, I try to inspire people to think, just keep working. Eventually, something good will happen. And don't think because you didn't win the first third of life, you know, your life is going to be condemned to you know, boredom or, or, or you know, second class kind of things. All right, well, let me take you back to the first third of your life again. So you talked about being at a law firm. I think it was with Ted Sorensen at Paul Weiss. And then suddenly, uh, at the age of 28, I believe, the ripe age of 28, you become a deputy assistant to President Carter. How did that happen? Well, as we have observed over many decades, White House staffs are not filled on merit. Um, they tend to be filled on who worked in the campaign or who knew who. So I, uh, was, I left my law firm, and I got an interview with somebody who was uh, close to Jimmy Carter. And in fact, actually, I got a call saying, would you like to interview for somebody who's running for president, to work on the staff of somebody who's running for president? I said, who is it? The Jimmy Carter. I said, that's the peanut farmer from Georgia. He's never going to get anywhere. He said, yeah, but he's hiring people, and he might get the nomination, and this is a job in the general election. So I took the interview, because I didn't have anything else to do, and I got the job, and then we won the campaign. And, uh, as, you know, Carter reminds me, uh, he was 34 points ahead of Gerald Ford when I started, and Carter won by one point. So he said, what was your contribution? But in the end, I got the job. I got an office in the West Wing, and at 27, I actually was the deputy domestic policy advisor to the President of the United States. I wasn't qualified, but he wasn't qualified. None of us were qualified. Um, so we, we did it. And uh, actually, Carter did an incredible number of things. He didn't get credit for it at the yeah, time. But uh, um, so I got lucky because I worked in a campaign. I wasn't really qualified right. for the job. Well, let me ask you, you just said that he didn't get credit. Um, with him announcing that he's unfortunately now in hospice, there's, I think, a, a reappraisal, a revisionist view of his presidency starting to emerge. John Alter, who's going to speak here tomorrow, wrote, a, I think, a right. very glowing book. Kai Bird wrote a glowing book. Are you finally happy to see that he's getting his just due and that people are starting to appreciate him for his goodness, well, his steadiness? I'm happy for a couple of reasons. One, he deserves it. But secondly, for selfishly, um, if you work in a White House and you're really smart, uh, but the White House is not successful, people will think you're not very competent. If you are um, a very honest person and you work in the Nixon White House, people think you're not you know, honest. Um, if you are um, idiotic, but you work in a brilliant White House, John Kennedy's White House, people think you're smart. So you take on the color of the president you work for. So for all these years, people didn't think Carter was that great, so people think I'm not that great. But um, <laughs> the truth is that Carter You, you was, were fighting inflation, though, right? I that got was into 19 percent. It's yeah, hard to do. Right. Um, nobody's invited me back to government since then. 19 percent is very hard to get That's to. That's hard. That's tough to do. Uh, Carter was, uh, look, Carter, um, he basically, he, he was a governor of Georgia. He saw people coming in to, to get his support for the Democratic nomination in 1976. And he said, hey, I'm smarter than this person. How come this person's running for president? So he had the audacious idea that somebody from the South, the Deep South, could run for president. And he had a brilliant campaign idea, which is to say that he would be giving everybody a government as good as the American people, which maybe is good, maybe not. And he did some really clever <laughs> things. And as a result, he got the nomination, got the presidency. And he tried to do so many things that he got criticized for failing. But today, if you get this one bill through, you get an appropriations bill through, you're considered successful. You get a debt limit bill through, you're considered successful. 
In Carter's days, he threw everything up on Capitol Hill. Half of it actually got through. The other half didn't, so he was criticized for that. He's also, he didn't have the good looks of, 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 of Ronald Reagan or the charm of Ronald Reagan. Uh, but what he's done since he left the presidency, which he left at 56 years old, he's now uh, in his late 90s, is amazing. He's become the role model for what you do after you leave your official position as President of the United States. And really, all the other presidents since then want to be like Jimmy Carter, solving problems around the world and, and solving health problems. And, you know, you can criticize him for various things, but on the, on the whole, what he's done with his life after he left the presidency is really a role model for every former president. So let me go back to the book, because we are at the business school, and I see there's a lot of students who probably want to learn how to invest wisely. Um, in the book, what struck me is that almost all of the 23 subjects at one moment had that kind of lucky break or that epiphany that got them on their way to being a great investor. And one of the, my favorite stories is Ron Barron, who's completely lost. He goes door to door um, selling toothbrushes. And he gets to one guy, and the guy says, what are you doing with your life? You should be a patent examiner. Of all things, a patent examiner. That one piece of advice changed Ron Barron's life, and he ended up, ended up becoming one of the world's great investors, a billionaire many times over. So in the world, in politically, clearly getting attached to Jimmy Carter was your big break. You talk about, in the world of finance, that you kind of took, you, you took note of a former Treasury Secretary right. who was able to flip a greeting card basically overnight and make a fortune. And that was your epiphany, right. that maybe you were better suited to be in the world of finance than in the law. Well, is that, is that an exaggeration? More or less, that's right. I mean, basically, uh, in the book on leadership, I said, the most important thing to be a leader is have luck. You need to have luck. And how do you get luck? Well, you don't sit in your office all day and just say, I'm not going to talk to anybody. I'm not going to meet anybody. You have to go out and meet people. You don't know who you're going to meet who might have an idea for you. You never can have too many connections. And, and, and so I've kind of you know, tried to make as many connections as I can. You never know what good thing can come from knowing somebody who might have an idea for you. In that particular case, I was practic after I, we lost the election to Ronald Reagan in 1980, I had to go back and practice law. And uh, people came to me in the White House all the time saying, you're a bright young man. If you ever want a job, call me up. But then um, when I called them after we lost the election, they didn't call me back because nobody wanted a Reagan, you know, in the Reagan era, nobody wanted a Carter White House aide. So it took me a long time to get a job, and I didn't want to tell my mother that her only job was unemployable. So I kept saying I had so many job offers, I didn't know which one to take. Uh, so after January, February, March, April, May, she said, David, just take one of those job offers. So finally, I got a job offer. I practiced law. I realized, again, I wasn't very good at it. And so I read about Bill Simon, who'd been Secretary of the Treasury, who bought a company called Gibson Greeting Cards from RCA, put in a million dollars of his own money, and made $80 million in 18 months. Now, I didn't know what a leveraged buyout was, but I thought that was more uh, likely to be promising for me than practicing law. So I tried to form the first buyout firm in Washington, D.C. to do leveraged buyouts. I didn't have any experience in that, but I hired some people who knew something about finance. And when they showed up, I said, I meant to say to you guys, I was going to get the money. I didn't have the money to invest. And they were a little disappointed, but eventually it, it worked out. It's amazing, right, that you didn't, you didn't go to business school. You're not a mathematician like a right. Jim Simon. Yet you had the courage, the tenacity, the chutzpah to start a private equity firm and then go out and ask really sophisticated people to give you money. So when you went to give, when you, when you went to give well, your you pitch... Say how, maybe they weren't that sophisticated. Well, maybe they were. <laughs> so when you went to give your pitch, now you're at the ripe right. age of 37, do you go in with humility or do you go in with total brashness and say, okay, well, I need um, your money because I'm going to make it work? I should have added that I read a book that said that an entrepreneur will start his or her first company between the age of 28 and 37. And if you haven't started a company by the age of 37, you probably never will. Hmm. I read that when I was 37. That's when I started crawling. I said, I better do something. So I, I got started. Um, what happened is uh, in, in any organization, you have, to, can, you have to figure out what makes yourself useful. We've seen founders get kicked out of organizations all the time. Steve Jobs famously got kicked out of the company he started. But people get kicked out of companies they start, and so just because I started Carlisle doesn't mean that they were going to keep me there. So I had to figure out what am I going to do? I don't really have an MBA. I didn't really know finance. So I have to figure out how to make yourself useful. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll go out and raise the money, which means going out and begging for money. And now I wasn't thinking I was going to be good at that because I didn't play golf. I'm not a big beer drinker, I don't wear suspenders, the kind of things I thought fundraisers did. But, you know, basically I would go out and talk to people I knew, and then they would introduce me to somebody else, and I'd always listen to them first and see what they were talking about and what they had on their minds, and then kind of you can uh, gauge what you're supposed to say based on what they tell you, you have to listen. 
uh, as Oprah Winfrey told me when I talked to her about interviewing, she said she's not a good interviewer, she's a really good listener. And if you listen to what people right. are saying, you can probably gauge what you should say. And, right. and then basically persistence, persistence, persistence. So I would get turned down by people all the time, but keep going back politely and eventually you wear them down. So there's a lot of students here, and I think this is a question that's particularly relevant to them. When you started hiring for Carlisle, what were you looking for in an employee? Was it pedigree? Was it high IQ, high EQ, personality, persistence? Well, what was it? What, what's I've that been, secret ingredient I've in your mind? I've interviewed thousands of people, young people. I'm not, and I did bring in senior people like Jim Baker or George Herbert Walker Bush and a lot of famous people. And when I interview them, it's a little different, but um, not quite an interview. Uh, they're interviewing me more. But when I'm interviewing younger people, I'm looking for reasonable intelligence. I don't want a genius. As hard, I've hired geniuses that are impossible to manage. So I don't want geniuses. I want reasonably intelligent people. People that have a good work ethic, that are willing to work hard and don't just work nine to five, because you're not going to ever do anything great nine to five, five days a week, um, despite what people might tell you. You just can't do anything great that, that, that short a period of time. Third, I'm looking for people that have some intellectual curiosity. They're asking questions all the time. And like sometimes if I ask uh, an interviewee, uh, do you have any questions for me? And they say no. I don't think that person has a lot of intellectual yeah. curiosity. Yeah, it's you know, tell. Ask questions. And the question shouldn't be, what's the starting salary? <laughs> yeah. They shouldn't ask that question. So yeah. I'm looking for people that also want to do something with their life that's useful. They, they're doing private equity because they see it as a useful way to spend time helping companies, make companies better, employ people. But ultimately, in the end, when they get the product of that wealth, they were going to do something by giving it back to society. And I try to gauge whether these people really that I'm interviewing have an interest in doing something more significant with their life than just making money. And when I find the kind of qualities that I want people, those are the people I hire. And sometimes I made mistakes and sometimes I didn't. I hired Jay Powell years ago. I thought he'd be it's good, um, good hire. It was okay. And now yeah, I can't remember what he's doing now. But yeah. he's doing something. Something, with infla uh, something with inflation. And then I hired a guy named Glenn Youngkin and uh, he was right out of uh, business school. He seemed to be going okay. No. Now, Thinks he might be running for president. I don't know. But um, so I've hired a lot of people. I've made some hiring mistakes. And when you make a mistake, it's you know, it's it's not pleasant sometimes. But I've made mistakes all the time. Going back to the books, um, Stan Druckenmiller, which I thought was one of the most interesting chapters in your book, says that the measure of a great investor is the ability to go big when you've yes. got conviction. He went really, really big by shorting the British pound decades ago and made seven billion dollars, I think, on the trade. Do you agree with that? And have you gone big in, in, in is, is that a part of your investment Well, as philosophy? a general rule of thumb, the most important rules for average investors, and my book is not written to be to make somebody stand drunk a miller. It's for the average person who doesn't really know how to manage money, they should take a look at my principles that they should do with it, or for business students who want to know how they can grow into being a good investor but aren't there yet. Um, Stan Druckenmiller was a person who was typical of people in this book. He wanted to, he worked as a, lum, as a forest ranger for a while, and then he ultimately went to work in a bank as an analyst, and then he got into investing by, by uh, happenstance, it was a fluke, and then he became a great investor, hired by George Soros, and Soros had the idea, when you have a great idea, double down, triple down, and do everything you can to take advantage of that great idea, because you rarely have great ideas. The idea was to short the British pound, and it turned out to be a great idea when Druckenmiller said to Soros, I put a billion dollars in this, and uh, Soros said, well, that's such a great idea, let's put two put billion seven. in, three billion in. Right. So as a general rule of thumb, though, uh, the better idea for most people is to not put all your eggs in one basket and not uh, and, you know, basically spread out your, your, your wealth. Uh, for average person, the most important rule in investing is don't lose what you have. And number two is diversify. Number three, give your money for average people to people that know what they're doing. Because generally, if you're a doctor, a dentist, or a lawyer, you don't really have the time to be a great investor. So you should find people that really know what they're doing and give them reasonable rules, make sure that you understand the fees. That, that's what you should do with your money if you're an average person. Yeah, that's good advice. Um, one person who did go big was Sam Bankman Freed. Now, he's not one of the 23 subjects in your I book. Did, I did interview him. But you did interview him. Yeah. And I want to ask you, so was your first tip off that there was something just off about Sam when he showed up in your office wearing a t-shirt and jeans and you were in a suit? Was that like the um, first? It was a little off-putting, um, I would say. He showed up with tennis shoes, socks, shorts, um, baggy shirt, and you know his hair was not, I would say, combed. Um, <laughs> and he, you know, his leg was shaking all the time. I didn't yeah. know what that was about. I, somebody told me it might have been Adderall or something. I don't know. But um, 
He was unusual. Now, when you meet an unusual young person, you don't know if the person is a truly a genius and you haven't observed it because you're not smart enough to observe how brilliant he is or whether he really isn't a genius. Uh, he is a very smart guy. I'm sure he would, if he took an SAT test, he'd get an 800, 800. Uh, but he didn't have certain other attributes you might want, like integrity or, yeah. or other things. So I, I, I'm not in the middle of that, that lawsuit or what's going on, but I would say it's going to be tough for him because he's got three people who were his partners who pled yeah. guilty. Yeah. So uh, yeah. um, tough situation. But yeah. I, I, I generally prefer people that look a little more normal when I'm interviewing <laughs> yeah. because it, otherwise it distracts me. Yeah. What, what, what I, where, where I really want to go, though, is what's your general view on crypto? Because there are a lot of people yeah. here that are probably still wondering, is it something well, I should get into or my, not? My view on crypto has been this. If, if you go to Las Vegas to gamble, you know, some people, you know if you go to Las Vegas, you're going to lose money if you spend there long enough time. You, if you win the first day, you're going to go back to the second day. And if you make money the first and second day, you're going to lose the third day. So you're going to lose your money. You all know that. But some people enjoy it, just like you enjoy, you know, other things in life. If you enjoy it, go ahead, take, allocate the amount of money you're going to have for that pleasure and, and be prepared to lose it. Well, crypto is the same way. If you get pleasure out of watching TV all day, seeing this, the oscillation of the crypto prices and talking about it with your friends, okay, and just allocate the amount of money that you're prepared to lose and then you won't be disappointed. If you think you're going to get rich doing it, you've got to be very careful because as it goes up, you're probably going to get sucked into thinking you are a genius and you probably aren't a genius. So I think you have to be very, very careful. Yeah. So uh, Sam bateman fried came from a family, a white collar family of two Stanford professors. And if you read through your book, I think there's two things that become kind of consistent throughout all of your great investors. Most of them came from a blue collar background and most of them were voracious readers. Right. Do you think that those two indices are a pretty good measure of whether someone's going to be a great investor or not? Well, um, I have three children. Uh, they're all in private equity, so they're pursuing what I've called the mankind's highest calling. But um, there's no doubt that they had some advantages growing up, but they had disadvantages because if they were if they were successful in private equity, people want to say it's because your father did something for you. And secondly, um, when you were in a wealthy family, you're, you, it's hard to be as driven. It's just very hard to be as driven. When you grow up in a, in a poverty-stricken family or you're in a blue-collar family as I was, you know if you're going to get anywhere, you got to do it on your own. And you're, that drive is what really makes people successful. So the people in this book are successful because they had to have drive to get where they are because they couldn't fall back on their parents. Their parents weren't going to bail them out. And so I think it's an important thing. On reading, um, they, did, they read a voracious amount. Everybody they can't did. read too yeah. much. They Everybody read did. everything. It's amazing. And, uh, let me just talk about this. This is a book fest, festival. Let me talk about reading. Reading is what really made me get lucky in life. I, my parents couldn't afford to buy books, and there weren't a lot of bookstores in those days. You went to the library, and I could get my first library card when I was six. You were allowed to take, 12, take out 12 books a week. I would take out the 12 books. I'd read them the first day, and I had to wait another six days or seven days before I could take out more books. I love reading because it exposed me to a different world. And I chair, for the last 10 years, I've chaired the National Book Festival in Washington, which I encourage all of you to come to on August the 11th and 12th of this year in Washington. We have 200,000 people coming hmm. with authors from all over the, uh, the world. And the reason I think it's important is that books focus the brain in a way that uh, reading a, tw a tweet doesn't. You know, you can read emails all day and learn some things, perhaps. But if you read a book, you're going to focus your brain you're going, to be, uh, you're going to say, how did this thing happen that I'm reading about? Maybe I could do something. I'd be inspired by something. So I think reading books is more important than reading almost anything else. And I've, I try to read 100 books a year. I have a trick to it, which is I interview a lot of authors, and therefore I read the books. But I, you don't have to read 100 books a year. But try to read books and read books about things that you really are interested in. And I, I think it's a, it's a very good thing to do. And, and so all the people in the book uh, and I've wrote, written about have voracious reading appetites, yep. not just books, but everything, journals, other things. You can't read too much. Yep, totally agreed. Um, John, we turn to John Rogers, another one of my favorite chapters. He says that he thinks the key is to be greedy when others are fearful. So this is, I think you would agree, a pretty fearful moment. No one's quite sure if we're on right. the, okay. you know, are we going back up? Are we going down? Is it a recession? Is it, are we coming out of a recession? Do you think this is the time for people to go big? Well, as a general rule of thumb, the most common mistake that investors make is this. When the stock market's going up, they rush in. They're afraid they're going to miss something. And when the stock market's going down, they rush out. They're afraid they're going to lose all their money. You should really do the opposite. And that's what the great investors have learned. And what the, the, the thing they have in common is they defy conventional wisdom, go against the grain. 
So if the market's going down and it's choppy as it is now, you don't know where inflation's going to be, we're going to be in a recession now, now's the time you can buy things at a more uh, affordable price. And so what John Rogers does is he does what Warren Buffett does. He tries to buy, uh, you know, uh, but Warren Buffett calls cigar butts, or things that have been dropped on the floor, nobody wants them, you pick them up and maybe they're worth something. And uh, Warren Buffett is trying to buy something that's worth a dollar for 50 cents. And that's what a value investor does. And I think there's now a lot of opportunity for that if you know what you're doing. You have to know what you're doing. You just can't speculate. Read as much as you can about the company you want to invest in and, and, find, and talk to other people who know what they're doing and get some advice. Make sure you know the rules of what you're buying. If there's fees involved, make sure you understand the fees. But, you know, and learning how to make a mistake is also important, too. Every investment isn't going to work out. If every investment works out, you're not really investing. Well, what's, it well, doesn't work out that way. Well, what's the worst, what's the worst mistake you made in your investing career? My, the, the, what's the worst, uh, let, me, let me rephrase it. What's the worst investment you ever made and what's the best investment you ever made? Well, the worst were the reels I didn't do. When, when Mark Zuckerberg was in college, um, my now son-in-law was his classmate and he said, this, this young man's going to start a company that's a college dating service. I said, those things don't work. So he wanted me to put in like $30,000, which later became worth $15 billion, which I didn't do. Um, when Jeff Bezos was starting his company, um, he needed a book, uh, he needed a, a, a bibliography of books in print. One of our companies owned it. Um, he apparently worked at a deal to get $100,000 a month, or $100,000 a year, we'd rent the bibliography of books in print so he could sell books over the internet. And he had apparently offered 25% of his new startup company to our people. And our people said, we don't take stock in startup companies. So when I later figured out his company might get somewhere, I went out to see Jeff and said, Jeff, you know, maybe we'll take that 25% of Amazon now. And he said, geez, I was, you know, two years ago, I don't think I need you as much. But I'll tell you what, I'll give you 1% and we'll call it a day and no $100,000 a year, 1%. He gave us 1% of the company, which I had no confidence in, and I um, sold it at the IPO. Wow. So that was about $15 billion uh, lost as well. So I've made some mistakes, and you know, if you don't make mistakes, you're really not in the game. And I, you know, there was a young guy who showed up in my office one day, um, long hair, uh, jeans, and sandals, and um, he was brought in by a, a serious businessman, and the serious businessman said, this young man is a really smart guy. He has discovered how to navigate the Internet. I said, well, what's the internet, what's that? and what would I want to navigate it for? He said, no, no, we know how to do it. And this guy, Mark Andreessen, has figured it out. I said, well, you know, what, what are you trying to tell me? We're going to start a company that's worth $100 million. You can invest in a $100 million valuation. I said, you have no revenue, and you have no employees. Now, we're pretty smart here. Go away. He came back later at $50 million valuation. We said, we're still pretty smart. We're not doing that. This kid doesn't know anything. So that was... Uh, uh, that became Netscape, and yeah. it was sold for AOL for four and a half billion. So um, yeah, I've made a lot of mistakes. Yeah, well, you've done quite well. Where where are you uh, on the question of whether a uh, a responsible portfolio has to include investments in ESG? Where do you? St there's a raging in, in, debate in, what? in ESG. Well, ESG is more contra controversial than it was maybe a year or two ago. Yeah, that's why but I'm asking. The, the general theory of investing is you should maximize your return. That was the theory for most of investment history. Maximize return, do whatever you take to get the highest rate of return. In recent years, we've thought, well, wait a second, if you invest in a company that's destroying the environment, is that really a good thing to do? So we've said, invest in companies that are doing things appropriate for society, ESG um, metrics and so forth, uh, are used. Um, I think I, there's two schools of thought. One is that if you invest in something that has good ESG metrics, you'll probably get a lower rate of return. There's another school of thought, Al Gore and others have this view, that you'll get a higher rate of return because more and more customers, more and more suppliers, more and more employees want to work in companies that have good ESG metrics. It's unclear uh, what the right answer is. I suspect, though, that the world is moving, despite some of the backlash now, towards an ESG-friendly environment. And so ESG-friendly environment uh, companies are more likely to do well, I think, in the future, but the data is still a little bit unclear. Yeah. I think it's a debate that's going to rage as we get closer to 24 in the presidential election, for sure. Very red state, blue state question. Um, Dawn Fitzpatrick, in her chapter, said that she runs every single day to maintain her sanity. So what do you do every day to maintain your stat sanity and this crazy schedule that you keep? Well, I appreciate your implying that I am sane. But, um, <laughs> I, so um, I, um, you know, I, I wish I could exercise as much as she does. She runs every day, and she's really good at it. I, 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 try to exercise, I try to swim a lap once a day, once a year, or something like that. Um, you know, I, or maybe, I, I'm not a great exerciser. I should exercise more, and, and I do think it's, it's probably a, a fault of mine. But I, I, I try to read as much as I can. 
I try to talk to as many people as I can during the day to kind of find out what's going on and generally find some time that's quiet when you can just think from time to time and not just run around and just go from one thing to another thing. Yeah. But I, I, you know, I make a lot of mistakes and so I probably should do more exercising and more resting. And before I um, go to the audience for questions, I think every single one of your 23 subjects said they have no intention of retiring. I'm assuming that that applies to you as well? Well, retirement is a relatively modern concept. You know, people used to work until they died. And then, you know, more or less, I mean, for most of organized history, for 400,000 years, uh, when we came out of caves as, as homo sapiens, people just worked until um, they couldn't work anymore. Um, then we came up with a retirement concept many years ago, and the United States, when we invented Social Security, the retirement age was set at 65, which was actually the average life expectancy. So people were supposed to work until 65, and the average life, they lived to 65. So there wasn't going to be that much retirement. Um, I think retirement has changed a lot now because in retirement, you can do so many things you wanted to do before, but for whatever reason, you chose not to do it. Um, I um, am not going to retire in that sense because I love everything I'm doing and I'm keeping a you know, pretty active life. But at some point, I realized that the brain will atrophy a bit or the body will atrophy a bit and it won't be able to do things. But I don't want to be like some of the people who the day that they retire, they go out and they relax and all the... Uh, the, the immune system relaxes and you have a heart attack. Have you ever seen these people retire and they're weak after they Later retire, they down. have a heart attack or something? So I don't want my immune system to think that I, it can relax because I don't want them to think I'm retired. Yeah, might have. Very good advice. Uh, any questions from the audience? Yeah. Um, now that that is becoming more and more expensive, what is your opinion on the role of private equity in growing the economy? Well, the question is, now that debt is becoming, say, more expensive, you're more expensive in the sense that it's harder to get? Okay. Well, when buyouts were first done, uh, the amount of equity was 1 to 5 percent, and, and the famous RJR deal in 1989 was only, was only 5 percent equity, 95 percent debt. Today, a buyout deal is about 50 percent equity, 50 percent debt, so the debt cost isn't as much as it used to be. In addition, there's much more competition provided debt than it was was before, what used to get it just from banks. Now there's so many different sources of capital and it's global. So the cost of debt isn't the biggest factor these days. And in addition, in private equity, it's, it used to be that private equity meant buyouts. Now it can mean growth capital or venture capital or things that don't require any debt. So it, you know, nobody wants higher uh, interest charges, but it's not a uh, debilitating factor as much as it was 20 or 30 years ago. Well, I got plenty more. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, that question is: uh, My firm, Carlisle, just announced a new CEO, Harvey Schwartz. And the question is: What did we see in him? Uh, well. Um, I would say he's a very smart person for sure. Um, he's a person who rose up to be the chief financial officer of Goldman Sachs, and I think the co-chief, uh, co-president of Goldman Sachs as well. Um, he was uh, a person who didn't become the CEO of Goldman Sachs, but he was very smart, hardworking, and he's a perfect example of how you can um, not win the first third of life in a sense. And he graduated, he had some family issues. He graduated from high school, he didn't even go to college. Didn't even go to college, didn't even think about going to college. He became, I think, an exercise instructor or something like that for a while. And then finally somebody said, why don't you go to college? And he, he applied to Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, got rejected. And then finally he got into Rutgers and then later he had, began a career. So he's a guy that really worked hard because he had to make something of himself. But what we saw in him was a very smart person, energetic, had good public company experience, was available. Uh, we didn't have to wait six months or nine months. Very often you have garden leaves and things like that. So a lot of things. And, he, you know, I thought, uh, you know, very well uh, of him from the start, from the first time I met him. I didn't know him that well. Yeah. yeah. I'm uh, sitting here next to my son, and I was uh, really interested in your earlier thoughts about your humble beginnings. Right. I was wondering, what, what, are the, what are the core values you took away from your parents that you later than the best of Yeah. Well, Warren Buffett says the best thing your parents can give you, and his parents gave him that, he said, is unconditional love. If you get unconditional love from your parents, then you've got the strength to know that you are going to go out and your parents will support you. And my parents, they were not educated. They didn't graduate from college or high school. 
Um, but they were willing to, to support anything I wanted to do. And I told them I wanted to go to law school. They were supportive of it, though they didn't really understand what I was trying to do as a lawyer, nor did I understand probably either. Um, they, um, they, they, they just gave me unconditional support and love, and whatever they, they could do, they would do. But um, I, I think that's the best thing you can do for your parents, or for your, for your children. And you know, in the end, all the things that you cite about things I've done, they're insignificant compared to the legacy you have with your children. And as I've said, the hardest thing to do in life throughout the world, throughout history, is raising happy and healthy children. All of you who are parents know it's not easy. It's even harder if you are wealthy or successful because you have so much time that taken away from your children when you're, you're building your career. And also, if you have a lot of money, it can easily spoil your children. So I'm sure all of you know people who are the children of wealthy people who may be a little spoiled and maybe not the kind of children you might want. It's very easy to spoil your children if you've got money. And so, I try very hard to make speeches saying, I'm giving away all my money. I was an original signer of the Giving Pledge, giving away all my money. I'm hoping my children will read these speeches and then realize that they better work hard because, you know, there's not going to be anything when they open the will. Let, let me ask you a question about your philanthropy because I, I think it's one of the defining features of your career and your life. You're one of the most philanthropic, generous people in the world today. You were, in fact, you were, one, I think, one of the original signers of the Giving Pledge. When you look at your fellow billionaires who are not as generous as you are, do you privately see? You know, I don't want to, first of all, there's- No names, no names. I would say, you know, look, philanthropy is often done anonymously and some people don't put their names on things. I do put my names on it because I want to inspire other people to say, look, this guy came from nothing and he's giving away money. So, and what I've tried to do, to my surprise, is give things back to the country. So I, I am in the process of giving away my money but I try to do it in things relating to, um, I, I have four rules. One, I want to start something, otherwise it wouldn't get started. Two, finish something, otherwise it wouldn't get finished. Three, have an intellectual interest in it, so I'm not just giving money, I want to be involved with it. And I often tell people the greatest philanthropy is giving your time, because you can't make more time, you can make more money, you can't make more time. So giving your time is important to me, and that's my fourth rule is, I would like to see some progress in my lifetime. And so I've been heavily involved in education because when you give scholarships to, to, to people, that really, you see the progress there. So I've spent more time, I think, on university boards um, than anybody else in this country. I've spent 12 years on the Hopkins board, 12 years on the Duke board, 12 years on Chicago, and now six years on the Harvard board. And I like it because you get to have fresh ideas from people there, but you're helping students. And I think universities now play an incredible role in not only educating students, but doing research and convening people to help uh, do things that maybe universities weren't doing 100 years ago. Our greatest asset, or one of our greatest assets in our country is our university system, and our university system is really the envy of the world. People come from all over the world to get an education here, and we should realize that we have to preserve these and enhance these universities, that's why I spend time on that. I also try to do a lot to give back to the country what I've called patriotic philanthropy, which is to say, remind people of the history and heritage of our country. So fix the Washington Monument, okay. buy the Magna Carta, buy the Declaration of Independence, put it on display. Why? Well, because when people see these things in person, it, it, it makes them learn more about our country than they knew. And right now, we don't have really great civics uh, yeah. education in our country. We don't learn a lot about American history so much as, as, as we used to. Um, people who um, are members of Congress should know more about our country's history, I think. So I've convened a, a, dinner, a dinner once a month with members of Congress, and I interview a great author. Um, Walter Isaacson or someone like that, about what it means to be an American and what it means about the people they've written about, and we try to educate members of Congress because they're making the laws. The theory about our democracy is that it's an informed citizenry. If you don't have an informed citizenry, you're not going to have a good democracy. And it turns out, fortunately, that if you see something on a computer slide, it's not the same as seeing it in person. So if you see a computer slide, what's in the Declaration of Independence, you can push a button and it goes away right away. But if you go see the original of the Declaration or original copy of it, um, you're more likely to be inspired and learn more about it. And so that's why I spend a lot of time on, on trying to remind people of our history and heritage. Well, it's, it's a great gift to the country. Well, issue. let me begin with saying financial literacy is a challenge because many people don't really understand anything about money and they just don't know what to do with it when they get it and they don't really understand uh, how to balance a checkbook or, or how to read a balance sheet or things like that. 
but I'm also worried about literacy. Uh, right now, it's hard to believe, but about 30%, 35% of adults in this country are functionally illiterate. Not financially functionally illiterate, they're illiterate completely, which means they can't read past the fourth grade level. And why is that? Well, our education system's not that, that good, and you can, you're allowed to drop out of high school and so forth. So you have an enormous number of people in this country who can't really read. And I don't mean people who came from overseas but can read their, their own language but can't read English. I'm not talking about that. They can't read their own language. We have 50 million immigrants in this country, uh, more than any other country in the world, but many of them um, are not literate in, in, in their own language or English, but we have a lot of people in the social underclass in our society that honestly just can't read, and that's a problem. So financial literacy is important, but we, is, we should not forget literacy. I've started literacy prizes and awards at the Library of Congress, and we try to promote the idea of literacy, and there are so many great literacy uh, organizations out there, but it's still a drop in the bucket. Uh, compared to what we what we really need, and I'll, I'll give you one example of an award we gave once to somebody. And it turns out mo most children learn to read from their parents reading to them. Yeah. If your parents are illiterate, they can't read to you, and so you have a, yeah. a deficit at the beginning. But um, sometimes when you have arms armed, armed service members around the world, um, you know those parents can't read to their children because they're not there. So there's an organization that's done a terrific job of making it possible for armed service people all over the world to get on up, in effect, a Zoom call with their children and read to them from wherever they are around the world. And, and that, and really, I'm sure, is going to help those children. But to me, you can't read too much to your, to your children because that's where they really learn how to, re how to read. And you can't get anywhere if you're not, you can't read. If you can't, you're illiterate, you're not going to get anywhere in society, in my view. Yeah. And I will say we, we are attacking that issue in New York City through public-private partnerships and investment banks. It's, it's an issue that we really care about in New York. Uh, you've already asked a question. Uh, wait, actually, the back, where were you? You were up before. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, please. What habits made you successful in the work and are still using those today? What, what made him successful and what is he still? Habits. What habits? Habits. <laughs> um, well, um, I guess a lot, there's a lot of luck in there, but I'm trying to, to be polite to people, um, trying to be respectful of other people, uh, trying to let other people tell you what they're thinking about and as opposed to telling them how great you are. Um, one of the qualities that I admire the most in people is humility. Um, you know, you can be a great leader, I suppose, if you're arrogant. You know, if your name is Alexander the Great, you know, I assume people, you know, he attached the name great to him, his name because he thought he was great. But the, the people that I most admire are people that are humble, and I think I try to be humble because I realize I have a lot of flaws, a lot of mistakes, and, and not as good as I'd like to be. But take Abraham Lincoln, you know, a motto of humility. Abraham Lincoln didn't get up in the morning and say, you know, I just won the Civil War by myself. I didn't need those generals. I did it myself. And you can't imagine him saying that. You, so there are some people that have risen to high positions that are, let's say, not humble, but they shouldn't be your role models. So I think humility is one of the most important uh, virtues. 50 seconds left. Yeah, go ahead. Right. Um, what you will get is a reputation. And what you'll find is if you do a good job, somebody will call your employer and say, how did he do or how did she do? And if they say he's really not very good, he's arrogant, he's not competent, it, it, it'll, it'll hurt, hurt your, your ability to get another job. So what you should try to do is do the job you, you're given and try to be respectful of people who are likely to be asked for um, references and do the best you can and learn as much as you can. Also, in any organization, try to find the thing where nobody is doing something and you can become an expert in it, and then you'll find that if somebody thinks you're an expert in area A, they'll say, well, he's so good in area A, uh, let's give him area B to work on, and then give A and B and then go to C and so forth. So try to be as good as you can because your reputation is all you really have. That's all you carry around with you is your education in your brain and your reputation. So let me just, I think we're out of time. I just want to make a final comment. Walter, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for helping to organize all this. Um, and. Um, Walter has uh, uh, had the hardest job in the, in the world in the last couple of years. We've been following around Elon Musk and we're going to write his book about him. So I look forward to reading that. I'm sure it'll be here at the next Nears Book Festival. Um, for everybody here, just try to think about what you can do to give back to our country. It's not a perfect country, but it's a, you know, the best country in the face of the earth. We have 50 million immigrants, as I mentioned. No other country in the world has anything close to that. The next highest immigrant country is Germany with 5 million. 
People come here because they believe in the American dream. Sadly, many people in our country born here don't believe in the American dream, but people outside the country do. And it's an incredible country with all our flaws and so forth, but what can you do to make the country a little bit better? And I'd like everybody to just think about what they could do to, to give back their society by giving their time or energy or ideas in a way that will make the country better so that your parents or your children will think, yes, I did something useful with my life. So for parents here, you know, when your time comes and, and you, your children are going to look at you and say, well, thank you for doing this for the country. That's what you should want. And the, and the same with, uh, with anybody here. Try to think about something you can do to give back to society, your university, society, the country, because you'll feel more meaning, uh, meaningful out of, out of that. And I think, selfishly, people that give back to other people feel good about themselves. And when you feel good about yourself, you live longer. So selfishly, if you, if you help other people, you're going to live longer. And so that's a, a selfish reason to, to try to help other people to, uh, and help our country. So thank you all very much.